The following Zoom session is being recorded and will appear later today on my YouTube channel, Math with Mayo. Therefore, when you participate in the Zoom meeting, if you do not wish for your picture or your name to be made public, please leave the video off and use an alias name. If you have questions during the meeting but do not wish to speak, email me at bmail at ryvcc.edu and I'll respond as soon as I can. All right, so today we're gonna go on and take a look at section, whoops, let's try that again. We're gonna take a look at covering objective 1D. Sorry, that was the message for the Math 95 class. Ignore that, ignore that. All right, before we go on, any questions over the weekend's assignment? Anything you wanna look at? Now is the time to speak. All right. We're going to go on then to objective 1D, which has to do with fractions. I want to switch over to the other screen and talk about some vocabulary words and whatnot. I'm going to insult you by reading what's in front of you. I know you can read in what's in front of you, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Okay. It says statements like all fabric is one third off of the regular price or the distance is one fourth of a mile are common everyday expressions. Each statement includes a number known as a fraction. A fraction consists of two integers separated by a line that is called a fraction bar. Typically the integers are stacked vertically as we see here. The top number is called the numerator and the bottom number is called the denominator. So we've got a numerator, a denominator and a fraction bar. These are vocabulary words that you want to become acquaint, uh, acquainted with. Okay. The denominator of a fraction tells into how many equal parts a quantity has been divided. The numerator of a fraction tells how many of those parts are present or being considered. For instance, suppose that a pie is cut into six equal parts. Now suppose that you eat five of those pieces. What fraction of the pie have you eaten? Since the pie is cut into six equal pieces, the denominator of the fraction would be a six. Since you ate five pieces of the pie, the numerator would be five. Consequently, the fraction would be five sixths. That is to say you ate five sixths of the pie. Any questions about that? Or are you just getting hungry? Maybe, maybe not. All right, any, any questions there? All right. We have two types of fraction, proper and improper fractions. A prop, in a proper fraction, the numerator, that's the number on top, is smaller than the denominator. For example, three sevenths, five eighths, or one half. A partially shaded object can be used to represent a proper fraction. For instance, in the following drawing, the rectangle is divided into eight equal parts. Five of these parts are shaded, so the fraction of the rectangle that is shaded is five eighths. Any questions about a proper fraction at this point? All right, then we have an improper fraction. The, in an improper fraction, the numerator is greater than or equal to the denominator. For example, 21 over 16, nine fourths or five fifths. As I was writing this book, I found out something I didn't know, and that is that uh, five over five is an improper fraction, okay? So a, a fraction equivalent to one is considered an improper fraction. There you go, learn something new every day. The following drawings can be used to represent an improper fraction. Each Mr. Mayo? Yes. What is the point in using improper fraction instead of saying like one and? A mixed number, okay. Um, it's just a different way of describing it. As we move into algebra, we'll find that typically they use improper fractions rather than mixed numbers quite a bit. And the main reason I've found for that, I think, has to do with if you have, hang on here, let me uh, switch boards for a minute the mouse there it is okay come on let's say we're talking about a variable x and we're talking about a coefficient the number in front of x okay 
if I write two and a half X as opposed to five halves X, apparently there's the possibility of confusion in that is this two times a half times X or is it two and a half times X? Where when you use an improper fraction, that confusion doesn't exist. Now, there may be other reasons, but that's the only one that I've come up with. You could also write it as a decimal 2.5 X, and that isn't confusing. But I think that that's why they tend to move away from mixed numbers a lot, okay? That's the best answer I've got for you at this point. All righty, so let's go back to our drawings here. Uh, let's see here, okay. The following drawings can be used to represent an improper fraction. Each circle is divided into six equal parts. 13 of these parts have been shaded. So you've got six plus six is 12 plus one is 13. So the shaded parts represent 13 sixths. Any questions about that? All right, uh, and in chapter one, don't worry about that, but we talked about how uh, a division symbol can be written as a fraction bar, as one of these, or as one of these. So again, a fraction bar is it a symbol? As a division symbol, the symbol. That's a combination of those two words. All right. Now I want to go down to here. Okay. Let's look again at these circles, the same ones we looked at before. This was thirteen sixth. Okay, which is an improper fraction. Another way we could look at these drawings is we could say this whole circle is shaded, so that's one. This whole circle is shaded, so that's one. One plus one is two and one sixth. So the improper fraction 13 sixths is equivalent to two and one sixth. And Courtney, there's your mixed number you were talking about. All right, now. A mixed number has two parts. It has the whole number part and the fraction part. So in this example, two is the whole number part and one sixth is the fraction part, all right? Now, how do you change 13 sixths into two and one sixth? Well, you do that by using division. So if we divide the numerator by the denominator, we have 13 on the inside, divided by six on the outside. The quotient, which is the result of division, the quotient becomes the whole number part of the mixed number answer. So 13 divided by six, 13 goes into six, or excuse me, six goes into 13 twice. Six times two is 12. We subtract the 12 from the 13 and we have one remainder. The remainder becomes the numerator and the divisor, that's this number, becomes the denominator of the fraction part of the mixed number answer. Now, what am I saying with all of this? 13 divided by six is gonna be two and one sixth. So final answer, two and one sixth, all right? Let's take a look at several examples of that to make sure that you're getting the idea. So let's say we have the mixed number seven and one. Wait, wait, go in the wrong direction. <laughs> we'll get there in a minute. Let's say we have the mixed or the improper fraction, 22 fifths, all right? And I want to change that improper fraction into a mixed number. So 22 divided by five, Five doesn't go into two, but five goes into 22 four times. Five times four is 20. We'll subtract the 20 from the 22 above, and we get a two. Since this number is smaller than the divisor, we know that we are, we've done it correctly and that we're done with the division process. So now the answer is four and two fifths. So 22 fifths equals four and two fifths. Any questions about how I did that? 
All right, let's take a look at another example. 73 divided by eight. So 73 divided by eight. Let's see, eight times eight is 64. Eight times nine is 72. That's, okay, that's getting close. So eight times nine is 72. We'll subtract that. We get a remainder of one. So we write nine and one eighth. So 73 over eight equals nine and one eighth. Any questions about that example? All right, do you need another example of changing an improper fraction into a mixed number or shall we go on? I guess we'll go on, okay. Give me just a second here. So now we'll go back to the textbook example. Now we want to go the other direction. We want to take a mixed number and change it into an improper fraction. So we're going to look at sort of the shortcut process of doing it. And then I'm going to go back and explain why we do what we do. Because sometimes we learn a shortcut, and then if we forget why it works, we don't do it correctly. So let's look at the long cut as well as the shortcut. All right. So we're going to start out with a, a mixed number, two and one sixth. Okay. The process is we're going to take the whole number times the denominator. Okay. So we're going to multiply together the two and the six, which is 12. Then we're going to add the numerator of the fraction to that. So we're going to take two times six is 12, plus one is 13. The result of step two becomes the numerator of the improper fraction. So the numerator is 13. The denominator of the improper fraction remains the same as the denominator as the, of the fraction part of the original mixed number. So we take two times six is 12 plus one is 13, all over six. Now, that probably seems like a great mystery. You've probably been given this way of doing things. I'm gonna go through several examples and then I'm gonna come back and explain why this is how we do those things, okay? All right, because I know you all want to know why. All right, so let's say we've got four and two fifths, okay? So four times five is 20, and 20 plus two is 22. So four and two fifths becomes 22 fifths. So I took four times five is 20, plus two is 22, all over the original divisor of the fraction part. So four and two fifths equals 22 fifths. How could I check my work right away? Well, I could take 22 fifths, 22 divided by five is four and two fifths, okay? Any questions about that example? All right, let's take a look at another example. Seven and three eighths, okay? So seven times eight is 56. 56 plus three is 59. So we get 59 eighths. We took the divisor times the whole number plus the numerator of the fraction, and we wrote that result over the original divisor. So seven and three eighths equals 59 eighths. Let's check our work. 59 divided by eight goes in seven times, seven and three eighths. Any questions about that? Do you need another example of this or are we good? Okay, I'll take it that we're good. So let's go back. And let's took a, take a look at this again and kind of look at it the long way. Seven and three eighths is equal to seven plus three eighths. Okay. 
Any questions about that? Seven is the same as seven over one. Any questions about that? Well, as some, probably most of you, maybe all of you already know, to add two fractions, you need something that's called a common denominator. Well, in this case, the common denominator would need to be an eight. Three eighths is already there. Seven over one is not there. I can take a number and multiply it times one without changing its value. So I'm going to take seven over one and I'm going to multiply it by one. But I'm going to choose as my one to write it as eight over eight. Isn't eight divided by eight equal to one? So multiplying seven over one times one is the same thing as multiplying seven over one times eight over eight. But now multiplying these two fractions together we multiply straight across and we get 56 eighths. So seven gets turned into 56 eighths. 56 plus three is 59 all over eight. Now there's a lot of information in there and we'll be going back over lots of it as we go through the class today. But I just wanna point out, what did we do? We took seven times eight and then we added three to get the numerator over the denominator. So this is doing it the long way, which is correct, but this is doing it the shorter way, which gives you the same result, okay? Do you need any other examples where I'm going through and doing it this long way at the moment? All right, excellent. So let's go back. And let's take a look at changing an improper fraction into a mixed number, okay? So we're gonna take 52 divided by seven. Uh, let's see, seven times six is 42, seven times seven is 49, seven times eight is 56, oh, that's too big. So seven times seven is 49, 52 minus 49 is three. So 52 sevenths equals 70, oops, wrong, equals seven and three sevenths, okay? Let's check our work. What's seven times seven? 49 plus three is 52 all over seven. So it checks, okay? Let's take a look at another example. Here we're gonna change the mixed number five and three eighths into an improper fraction. So five times eight is 40 plus three is 43, 43 eighths. So five and three eighths equals 43 eighths. Let's check our work. 43 divided by eight goes in five times, remainder of three, so five and three eighths. Okay. Now, again, Courtney, you asked about why use an improper fraction instead of a mixed number. There still are cases where we'll use a mixed number. It kind of depends on the context of the problem as to which is the appropriate answer. Okay. So we'll see that as we go through problems where, oh, in this case, the fraction is better. In this case, the mixed number is better. All right. Now, we're going to take a look at something called prime factoring. But before we do that, let's talk about prime numbers. A prime number is a whole number whose only divisors are the itself, that whole number, and one. So you can't divide the number by anything other than itself and one, okay? For instance, let's take the numbers one through 
let's see here. Let's see how far I can get on just this one line. All right, so let's determine which of these numbers are prime. Well, again, I said it had to be a number larger than one. So one is not a prime number whose only divisors are itself and one, okay? Only whole number divisors. Two, two can be divided by itself and two can be divided by one. In fact, all these numbers can be divided by itself and one. The key is, is are those the only things that divide it? And that makes them prime. So two can only be divided by itself and one. So two is a prime number. How about three? Three can be divided by itself in one, but it has no other whole number divisors. So three is a prime number. How about four? Four can be divided by itself and by one. I see you shaking your head. Yeah, four can also be divided by two. So four is not a prime number. Five. Five can only be divided by itself in one. So five is a prime number. Six can be divided by itself in one, but it can also be divided by two, and it can be divided by three. So six is not a prime number. How about seven? Seven can be divided by itself and by one, but it can't be divided by anything else. So seven is prime. How about eight? Eight can be divided by itself and divided by one, but it can also be divided by two, and it can also be divided by four. I know this is getting boring. It's like, oh, the same thing. We're all, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Hang in there. All right. Wait, we have an interruption, some magic tricks. Notice the rings? They're hooked together, and now they're separated. Isn't that amazing? Okay, now that you're awake, going on. Nine. Nine can be divided by itself and one, but it can also be divided by three, so it's not prime. 10 can be divided by five and two, not prime. 11 is prime. It's only divisors are itself and one. 12 is not prime. In fact, none of these even numbers larger than two are prime because if they're even, they can be divided by two. How about 13? 13 is prime. How about 15? Oh, three and five go into it. How about 17? Oh, 17 is prime. So two, three, five, seven, 11, that's a 13. It's kind of hard to read that. Let's write it a little more legibly. 13 is prime and 17 is prime. And there are prime numbers going on and on up, but that's enough for right now. Now, let's talk about prime factoring. Prime factoring is where you have a number larger than one that's not a prime number, for instance, six. And you pull it apart into factors that are prime numbers. Maybe we need to talk about what factors are. Factors are things that you multiply together to get a product. So two times three equals six. Two and three are the factors of the product six. So now we're pulling six apart into prime factors. Well, six is two times three. And since two and three are both primes, this is what we call the prime factorization of six. Okay, how about the number nine? Nine is not prime, it's three times three. So three times three is the prime factorization of nine. And we can write three times three that way, or we can write it three squared. Those are both ways of writing the prime factorization of nine. Okay, any questions before we move on? Okay, give me just a second here. Uh, here. Ah. Okay. Here. I want to take a look at this information at the top of the page. If A divided by B is a fraction, then A times C 
divided by B times C is an equivalent fraction, provided that B does not equal zero and C does not equal zero. Remember, we talked yesterday about how you can't divide, not yesterday, but on Friday, dividing by zero is undefined, okay? So multiplying the numerator and the denominator of a fraction by the same non-zero number creates a new equivalent fraction, okay? If A divided by B is a fraction, then A divided by C all over B divided by C as an equivalent is an equivalent fraction, provided that B doesn't equal zero and C doesn't equal zero. In other words, dividing the numerator and the denominator of a fraction by the same non-zero number creates a new equivalent fraction. Okay, and I wanted to put this up there so that if you if you need it, you can go back and check the video later for reference. But now let's take a look at a bunch of examples of that idea. Okay. So let's say I've got one half. And I want to rewrite that as an equivalent fraction that has a denominator of a six. Okay. So I want to build one half into something divided by six. Well, I can multiply by one, but I want my new denominator to be six. When you're multiplying two fractions together, you multiply straight across. You multiply the numerators to get the new numerator, you multiply the denominators to get the new denominator. So two times what equals six? Two times three. But since my red fraction has to be equal to one, if I'm gonna multiply with a denominator of three, I have to multiply with a numerator of three as well. So then I get three sixths. So basically one half is equivalent to three sixths. Any questions about that example? Okay, let's take a look at another example. Let's say we have three sevenths and we want to, uh, let's see, we want a new denominator of 42. Okay, so the question now is, what times seven is 42? Or you could say 42 divided by seven is what number? So what number am I looking for? Anybody? Six. six. Excellent. Now, since we multiplied the denominator by six, we must also multiply the numerator by six so that in fact, we're just taking three sevenths times one. We're just writing that one as six over six, because that's what we need to accomplish our goal here, which is to get a new fraction with a denominator of 42. So the new numerator would be 18. So 3 sevenths is equivalent to 18 over 42. Any questions about that example? All right. So that's taking a fraction and building it to a new equivalent fraction. Let's go the other direction. Let's say that we want to take a fraction and we want to reduce it to a smaller but equivalent fraction. Well, sometimes we can just look at the fraction and say, oh, 15, 20, five goes into both of them. So I'm going to divide the top by five and I'm going to divide the bottom by five. 15 divided by five is three. 20 divided by five is four. So 15 twentieths equals three fourths. Any questions what I did there? Sometimes it isn't obvious what is common to both of them. And this one, hopefully it was, but let's take this one and let's look at it a different way. Let's take the numerator and do its prime factorization. 3 times 2. Let's take the denominator and do its prime factorization. Well, 5 times 4, except 4 isn't prime, so we get 2 times 2. 
times five. So the prime factorization of 20 is two times two times five. Everybody okay with what I'm doing so far? Any panic out there? We okay? Hopefully, all right. Now I'm gonna come back and I'm going to see that I have a common factor in the numerator and the denominator of a five. Well, five divided by five is equal to one. So I could reduce that down to one over one. And now what do I have left? In the numerator, three times one is three. In the denominator, two times two times one is four. So I get this answer. Now, obviously this was less work, but that's because at least I could see that five was the common factor we could break and get out of there. Sometimes you can't see that. And so this is the way to go to find what's common to the numerator and the denominator. Okay, how are we doing? Can you do another example of that? Absolutely. All right, let's see. How about uh, 18? over 33, okay? Hmm. Well, let's say I can't see the common factor, all right? So let's take 18 and let's break it down. It's even, two times nine. Two is prime, but nine is not prime. Nine is three times three. So two times three times three, is the prime factorization of 18. Are you okay with that? Courtney? I mean, as okay as I can be. Talk to me. Where am I losing yet? Uh, it's just a lot of steps. It's gonna yeah. take me a few minutes. Yeah, it is. And I know, I know Friday's assignment was big. Today's assignment is big. I know. My heart goes out to you. And you're thinking, yeah, what good does that do me? All right. Now, 33, two doesn't go into 33, but three does 11 times. 11 is prime. So 33 is three times 11. Ah. So what's the common factor that we could reduce out? A three over a three. So three over three reduces to one over one. In the numerator, I have two times one times three is six. In the denominator, I have one times 11, times 11, which is 11. And it can't reduce any further because what's left up here are all primes before I've multiplied it back together. We okay with that? Maybe, I know, all right. Let's take a look at another example, nine twelfths. Nine is three times three. 12 is two times six, which is two times two times three. See where I'm getting that? So 12 is two times two times three. So we can reduce out the common factor and we're left with three fourths. So nine twelfths reduces down to three fourths. Okay. All right, let's see here. Second. Right. More. Okay. Adding fractions and mixed numbers. All right. We're going to look at an example of adding two fractions that have the same denominator. Grandma Pat, 
made an apple pie and cut it into six equal pieces, okay? Her granddaughter, Jessica, ate one piece of the pie for breakfast, okay? It's what's known as pie cereal. So here we have the one piece that Jessica ate and two pieces of the pie for lunch. So here she ate two more pieces. What fraction of the entire pie did she eat? Well, she ate one sixth for breakfast and two sixths for lunch. So the total is three sixths. But how would you get that mathematically? One sixth plus two sixths equals three sixths. Notice we're adding the numerators, but we're not adding the denominators. We're adding the numerators and putting them over what we call the common denominator. So one sixth plus two sixths equals three sixths. Are you okay with that idea? Now, Look at the picture. Can you see that three sixths is also what? One half of the pie, right? Okay. Let's go back to our whiteboard. Maybe. There we go. Gotta find my mouse. Well, the prime factorization of three is three because three is a prime number. The prime factorization of six is two times three. So the common factor that we can reduce out is three over three. Now you need to be careful. This is not correct. This is correct. We didn't take the threes and cancel them, we reduced them. So we still have a one in the numerator. And then two times one is two in the denominator, okay? That's a common mistake. People just, they say, oh, we're going to cancel the threes. We're not canceling anything except my favorite TV shows. We're going to reduce the three over three to a one over one. So we're left with one half. Okay. Any questions about that example? I know, I know a lot to swallow and we're just getting started. Okay. Let's take a look at this example. 3 tenths plus 4 tenths. So we're adding two fractions with the same common denominator. So we add the numerators over the common denominator. 3 tenths plus 4 tenths is 7 tenths. Now, if we did the prime factorization of 7 tenths, we'd have 7, which is a prime number, over two times five, which is the prime factorization of 10. But there are no common factors to reduce out. So seven tenths is the final answer. It doesn't reduce. Okay. Any questions about that example? Let's take a look at some more examples. Three seventeenths plus five seventeenths would be eight seventeenths. Eight could be written as two times two times two, but 17 is a prime number. So it won't reduce, there's no common factors. Eight over 17 is our final answer. How about this one? Don't freak out, two over X plus seven over X. That would be nine over X. Well, what's X? Nobody cares at this point, but X is X. So two out of X plus seven out of X is nine out of X, okay? See, nobody died, it was okay. Boy, just keep breathing. All right, do you need another example of that or are we okay? And again, Danielle, yeah, can I like hear you? Yeah, I'd like another one. All right. Have another another butter peanut butter sandwich cookie. Here we go. Well, let's see. How about three eighths plus plus three eighths? Yeah. So that would be six eighths. You okay with that? But oh look, six and eight are both even. 
So I know I can divide both the top and the bottom by two and get down to three fourths. There, I didn't even use prime factoring because it was obvious to me they were both even. Okay, you all right with that? All right, how about this? How about um, one ninth plus two ninths plus five ninths? Oh, we've got three fractions all with the same denominator. One plus two is three, plus five is eight ninths. Okay. All right, we're gonna go on. Now, let's say we're going to add two mixed numbers, four and five twelfths plus four and one twelfth. We can add the whole number parts. What's four plus four? Eight. We can add the fraction parts and they have the same denominator. So what's five twelfths plus one twelfth? It's six twelfths. Okay. Think of it this way. Let's say you had $3.12 plus $2.14. Wouldn't that give you $5.26? So you're adding the dollars and then you're adding the cents. Okay. That worked for you? Oh, but six over 12 could be reduced to what? One half. half. Okay. You all right with that? Okay. Now the fun begins. You were thinking that was the fun part. Oh, no. And I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking, oh, boy, are we going to make it? Well, we'll do what we can. Let's say I've got the following, negative two thirds plus negative one seventh. Well, first of all, now all of a sudden you've thrown negative numbers in there. What are you doing, Mr. Mayo? Well, we looked at over the weekend, adding and subtracting integers, positive and negatives, adding two negatives, we're gonna get a negative answer, but we have another problem. The denominators aren't the same. So we need to find what we call the least common denominator. Well, in this case, three and seven are prime. So the least common denominator is just gonna be three times seven. So now I'm gonna rewrite this problem like this. I need to take negative two thirds and rewrite it as negative something over 21, okay? Negative two thirds equals negative something over 21. We did this a little earlier. What's the missing piece? What do I need to multiply by three to get 21? Seven. So my numerator is gonna be negative well, 14 over 21, I'm leaving the negative sign. Well, let's there, we'll put it right there, okay? So negative two thirds becomes negative 14 over 21. Are you okay with how we got there? Is it just the numerator that's negative or is the whole fraction negative? Yes. Not being a smart aleck, let me explain. Negative two thirds equals negative two thirds equals two over negative three. So in this case, it's applied to the whole fraction, but this is not, this is not the same as that, okay? So you can either apply it to the numerator or out front to the whole thing, but it's still just one sign or to the denominator, but typically we don't leave a number in that uh, form, okay? So you could think of it either way. I know that's probably not the answer you wanted, but it's the truth. All right, now, what am I gonna have to do here to get to 21? What do I need? A three. Okay, there's my 21 and there's my new three. So. 
Negative two thirds became negative 14 over 21. Negative one seven became negative three over 21. All right. Now I'm gonna add two fractions with the same denominator. What's negative 14 plus negative three? It's negative 17 all over the common denominator. And again, I can write it that way or I could write it that way, okay? How are we doing? Okay, here we go. Uh, let's see here. Three eighths plus seven twelfths. Now, in the last example, because each denominator was prime, three and seven, I just took three times seven to get the least common denominator. Now things get a little more complicated. Here's what we're gonna do. We need to find the least common denominator of eight and 12. Some of you might be able to look at it and go, oh, it's 24. Great, I'm happy for you, go with it. But let's say you don't know how to get there, okay? There's a couple of ways of doing it. One of them is to do multiples. So you say, oh, there it is. There's the least common multiple. So there's the least common denominator. Okay, and that works, and there's nothing wrong with that, though sometimes that can get rather lengthy. There's another process that we're gonna look at, and that is doing the prime factorization, there it comes again, of each number. So the prime factorization of eight is two times two times two, the prime factorization of 12, let's see that one, is two times two times three. Now, the least common denominator is the product, so we're multiplying, of the highest power of each different prime factor. Well, here, this is what, two to the third power? This is two squared. Which one is a higher power, two cubed or two squared? which is a higher two power, cubed. two cubed. So our LCD is two cubed times three, which is eight times three, which is 24, okay? Now, you're sitting there going, I like that first way you did it better. And I understand that, but sometimes when the numbers are really not fun, you can have a big long list of things. So this is a good way to do it. It just takes a little while to get used to it. All right, so now I've got this. So I'm going to multiply 3 eighths by 3 over 3. So I get 9 over 24. And I'm going to multiply 7 twelfths by 2 over 2. So I get 14 over 24. Do you see what I did? Where I got the 24 and where I got the 24? Nine plus 14 is what? 23 over the common denominator. And that doesn't reduce, okay? Any questions about that one? All right. Uh, let's take a look at this one. Let's see here. One half plus seven eighteenths plus one ninth. Hmm. Well, I need a common denominator of two, 18 and nine. Can you see what it is? Anybody? 18. Excellent. This ain't broke, so we don't need to fix it. One half, we're gonna multiply by nine ninths to get 18 in the denominator. So one half becomes 9 over 18. 1 ninth, we're going to multiply by 2 over 2 because 9 times 2 is 18. So 1 ninth becomes 2 eighteenths. Okay with that so far? Now, 9 plus 7 is 16 plus 2 is 18. What's 18 divided by 18? 1. Excellent. 
They don't always work out that nicely. I may have planned that. Okay. Well, this is what I was afraid of. This, this was a lot to cover in one day. Okay. And really, I only got about halfway through what we need to do. Don't panic. Don't panic. So what we're going to do is I'm going to come back tomorrow and continue with this. All right. Um, and we'll see if we need to do an extension on the homework. We'll do that. But, but um, just a reminder that in WAMAP, there are videos that talk about everything. There, your assignment has 20 questions. And we got through about half of them in terms of the material we covered. So there's still some stuff we'll look at, okay? So uh, we'll pick that up tomorrow and see what we need to do if we need to extend the assignments. But I will be back at uh, 1.15 with an office hour. And so uh, with that, I'll stop the recording.